Wait, that's attached to three things? This? Yeah. No. This alpha carbon is yeah. attached to, oh, 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 yeah, maybe you're right, maybe I misspoke. So I should have said, this alpha carbon is attached to four different things. I'm going to go ahead and draw in the hydrogen here. Mm -hmm. Carbon, carbon, iodine, and hydrogen. So if you're attached to four things, you're sp3 hybridized tetrahedral. But now this guy is attached to only three things, so it's sp2 hybridized, which makes it trigonal planar. But also, carbocations are so important in OCAM that eventually you should just have memorized that carbocations are sp2 and trigonal planar. But okay. if you ever forgot that, you could figure it out. The carbocation is attached to three things, so it should be sp2 and trigonal planar. Okay, so the nuclear file can come in from either direction here. So that gives us these two products. Okay. All right. Um, now, are we done, or is there anything else going to happen here? We have to stabilize. By I can't close deprotonating. Technically, both of these will deprotonate, but let's just show the mechanism for one of these. So let's show the mechanism here for how this is going to deprotonate. So does the I minus come and attack the hydrogen? That's right. Let's and see if you can draw the arrows for that. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's go ahead and see if we can draw the arrows for what the deprotonation set will look like. So do you do it again by like the hydrogen will be used first and then the I or actually no never mind. That's okay. Right. Remember, hydrogen never just leaves into the ether. The hydrogen can't just leave. Even though sometimes textbooks draw it that way, there has to be somebody grabbing the hydrogen. The first thing I have to do is split off one of the hydrogens so it's in a position to be grabbed. Now I'm going to take this iodide that was produced in this step. I'll write it over here. So the iodide is going to donate its lone pair to this hydrogen. This should make sense to you. Why does it make sense for the iodide to be at the tail? Because it has a negative charge. People at, ne at, at the negative charges want to donate electrons. Why is it reasonable for the hydrogen here? Um, and, and then, well, this is a little harder to see. But remember also you have to draw this arrow. Oh, you do? Because otherwise these electrons would just be stranded. Right? You can't no, have electrons. They're still attached to the oxygen. That's right, but they're not attached in the bond anymore. So you must draw this arrow to show that the electrons in this bond are going into a lone pair. It wouldn't make any sense to have a bond where the, when the hydrogen is gone. Right? Once the hydrogen is gone, these can't be in a bond anymore. So um, even though they're still on the oxygen, we still need to show they're going from the oxygen has started by sharing the electrons, but now it's going to be owning them in a lone pair. So then our product here. And we'd have two of those, one dashed and one wedged, and those would be all our products. Right? I'm going to keep drawing the pairs of electrons. Now, so this pair of electrons went into this bond, and the pair of electrons that used to be in the hydrogen-oxygen bond has gone into a pair here, and we have to change two charges. The initial tail, this iodide started negative and it's losing electrons, so it becomes neutral. And the final head, this oxygen is at the final head. So you can see how important it is to draw this arrow, or you wouldn't see why we got rid of the charge. Remember, the whole reason we're doing this is to get rid of the charge. This started positive, and it's gaining electrons. Are there so technically it's two lone pairs? That's right. Um, I'm, just, I'm only drawing the pairs that are participating in the reaction. Should we only draw those things too? Yeah, actually, so the way most people would draw this, usually people don't draw the lone pairs at all. Usually people don't draw the lone pairs at all, but I think it's good for a beginning student to draw the pairs that are participating in the reaction just so that you can see what's really happening here. Um, so, uh, but yeah, uh, the, this should be fine uh, to draw it like this. You don't have to draw the lone pair that's not participating in the reaction. And I'm not going to show the mechanism for it, but you would also have a deprotonation over here. And again, this would end up like this. So the, the time to get the stereochemistry right was at this step. The stereochemistry was determined here. Um, so here we had to figure out whether this was on a wedge or on a dash. And All right, so these would be our products. Oh, it's okay for that arrow to go to the atom, um, right? It's like this one? The other one. Yeah, so you cannot have the tail of an arrow pointing directly at an atom. It's perfectly fine to have the head of an arrow pointing directly at an atom. The tail of an arrow has to be either on a lone pair or on a negative charge that represents a lone pair. That's just a convention. Um, now, is this like on the last midterm where if they say like draw the major products, we do some like we only Sure. Well, let's talk about this a little bit more. Here's our products, these two products. Now, are we going to get more of this? 
More of the right hand or equal amounts of both? Equal. Equal. How could you, how could you explain why that is? There's even attacking from both sides. Yeah, down. remember that at this point, we're trigonal planar, it looks like my hand. Well, it's just as easy to attack from behind my hand, it's just as easy to attack from one side of my hand as to attack from the other side of my hand. So generally speaking, when you attack something trigonal planar, you usually get equal amounts of the two products, unless there's something that's blocking one of the sides. But there's nothing blocking. with the HI also as a major product? Ah, uh, that's a, a little bit of a matter of taste. Um, it couldn't hurt to put this in here. This is certainly a major product. Um, if they said draw the organic products, then it would only be the carbon-containing products. So suppose they asked you to draw um, all possible products. We well, would draw these three things. And suppose they asked you to draw the major products. We'd well, still draw all three of these things, because in this case, these are both major. There's equal amounts of both. Remember that SN1 gives us a racemic mixture. Now we've just seen why it gives us a racemic mixture. Okay. Um, yeah, so sometimes, uh, instructors, sometimes instructors do or don't draw the inorganic product, but the safest thing is to draw the inorganic product, especially because we, we, we use this in the deep nation. So it would be safest here to draw this. Um, let's look at the handout again. Let's look at page one of the handout. And find the row on stereochemistry. Page one and the row on stereochemistry. All right, so we just reviewed here. SN2 gives you inversion. Why? Because there's a backside attack since the leaving group blocks the front side. Um, and that means you only get one product, one inverted product. How about SN1, racemization, because you have a carbocation intermediate. I said it was a chiral, but maybe the best thing to have stressed was that you have a trigonal planar carbocation intermediate. The real reason we're getting two different products here, racemically, is because we're attacking a trigonal planar carbocation intermediate. So that's just one of the many patterns that you're expected to know and be able to explain uh, for SN2 and SN1. There's lots of different patterns that are all summarized there uh, on that handout. All right, so we have to get in the habit of always thinking about stereochemistry, which matters again when the alpha carbon is uh, a stereocenter. All right, um, that makes sense? Yes. You want to do another SN1 example, or should we go to E1 and E2? I think we should move on, yeah. Move okay. On. Unless there's anything, any more like, detailed uh, there's not like millions of complications, unfortunately, but this is the main idea. Okay. So uh, as we saw last time when we focused on SN2. So basically, the moral is you should now go forth and do lots of practice on SN1 because there's definitely lots of little pesky complications that can come up. This is the basic idea. However, last time we spent the whole session, remember, on SN2. Mm -hmm. uh, and we saw even, even though we spent the whole session on SN2, every problem had a little detail we hadn't seen before. So the only solution is just to do a lot of practice to expose yourself to as many different possibilities as possible. But, but this is the basic idea. Okay, so okay. let's just do E1, E2 okay. now so that next time we can start with synthesis. Okay, good. Although, um, to be frank, it's useless to go over synthesis unless you've mastered the basic reactions. Okay. Um, so, um, weekend is full. Okay, <laughs> all right, so hopefully. So um, dedicated yeah. to. Okay, so we'll see. If the next session comes around and we haven't mastered the basic reactions yet, it would, uh, we just have to keep working on the reactions and put off the synthesis, basically. Okay. Synthesis requires mastery of the basic reactions. Okay. But if we haven't mastered the reactions yeah. by, no, by next time, then we need to make an extra appointment, like on Tuesday or something. Yeah. Maybe Tuesday. Oh, I thought you were going to say we need to use our miss and go to pass the first <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I literally thought that that's what you were going to say. So besides just doing any extra problems, any other way for us to master it? Right. Well, first of all, again, sit and study and meditate on the handout. Most of the key ideas are in the handout. And at this point, we've covered most of the stuff on there. If something is mysterious on the handout, you can ignore it. But most of the stuff we've talked about, remember, you need to both know the stuff and whenever possible, understand it. So you want to understand the reasoning in there. There's really a lot of information there. Actually, put it another way, you should be able to generate this handout out of your head. Yeah, I'm actually just going to take this yes. every with me for the next, like, five days. <laughs> yeah. So, again, yeah. when I said that you need to have mastery of the reactions, what that means is that you should be able to sit down and write this handout from scratch. That is, you should have to take a piece of paper and make one column for SN1 and one column for SN2. And then say, what are the stereochemistry for SN1 and SN2? Um, what's better for SN1 versus SN2, primary, secondary, or tertiary? Who needs a good nucleophile and who doesn't for SN1 and SN2? Um, what's the solvent effects for SN1 and SN2? I um, should be able to go through each of the basic ideas and put that out uh, on your own, out of your head. 
Uh, otherwise, you don't really have that mastery that you need for synthesis and difficult uh, problems. The other thing we talked about last time is, again, try to find the problems in the homework that have many different variations on the same thing, where they give you a, a big A through F, A through H problem, where they just give you many different variations on the same thing, and carefully study the solutions manual that explains the logic. Uh, for those. That's very important uh, as well. Okay. okay, so let me see if I can come up with a good E2 here.